Shares of grill maker Traeger are getting hit after the company's first earnings report since going public in July. Analysts have told me, though, the reaction looks overdone as Traeger beat on sales and profits, and guidance was also ahead of estimates due to strong grill demand. Let's check in with Traeger CEO Jeremy Andrus. Jeremy, good to good to see you again here. Uh, just let's start on the market response here. Are you surprised? Look, I got to be honest. Um, I haven't checked our stocks since we went public. And so uh, nice to see it up there. Am I surprised? You know what? I'm a big believer you build these things for the long term and you do what's right for the business every day. And some days the market likes you and some other days they don't. Apparently they don't this morning, but uh, we had a good quarter. I mean, this is a Traeger is about market share. It's about growth. It's about disruption. And there's some natural headwinds that we're facing in the business right now um, from a macro perspective, which every other company in the world who produces a consumer durable, particularly ships from Asia is facing. And so uh, I think we're doing a good job working around these pieces. Perhaps the market doesn't like that, but uh, great quarter. I mean, we, we grew 39% top line in the quarter and we guided full year to grow uh, approximately 40%. That's a good company. That's the thesis of this business. Jeremy, if you're not checking your stock price, that means you're not on the Yahoo Finance app. And we're going to have to take that offline. We'll, we'll, save, that for, we'll, we'll, take, we'll save that for a different no, chat. I check other email. people's stock. I check other people's, uh, just not my own. OK, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but talk to us about, so you are seeing strong demand, accessories and grills. But can you get enough components? Uh, where are you sourcing your, your products from? Uh, I know there continues to be a lot of bottlenecks coming out of China. Yeah, look, it, it, it's a complicated environment right now. And it's, it, it's not a... It's not a single thing. It's components. You know, it's it, it's access to uh, to port capacity, to 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 vessel and container capacity, and so we. I, I think we're doing a really good job in this environment. Our operations team has been very thoughtful around all of the components or the levers that we have access to to manage us. And so I will say that we feel good about our inventory position. We're building at high utilization rates in our factories. Uh, we're, we're shipping uh, effectively to the US. There are some bottlenecks, but we've chosen to take on some warehouse capacity in Asia so that we can continue to produce and, 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 and build up inventories, bring them over as we have vessel capacity. So I'd say it's, it's complicated. It's not easy right now, but um, you know, I, we, we feel like in the guidance that we gave, that we're able to deliver an unconstrained demand number and our inventory positions are building. And so relative to what I hear from other CEOs in the market, we're in a pretty good spot. I think we've managed through, uh, through, through some difficult uh, market conditions pretty well. Hey, Jeremy, Brian Chung here. So when it comes to uh, just the expense side of things, you've got a gross margin of 39.1%. You had a net loss of 4.9 million here. So when it comes to the outlook on managing the costs, and I understand that given everything you just said, there are some things that are a bit idiosyncratic to the uh, pandemic that we're facing right now, but how do you expect uh, the company to manage those going forward? Look, I, I think there are a few things. No, number one, uh, our, our goal is growth and market share. Not at all costs. This is this is this is disciplined growth. Uh, it's important that we protect the consumer and that we can deliver product. And so, to some extent, we're take, we're taking these higher costs, and we think that's the right thing to do in the near term. Uh, but there are things there. There are some levers that that we're accessing. Uh, we're we're implementing a price increase, and and I would say we're we're a little bit late relative to competition. We didn't want to be first to drive uh, price increase, but we're implementing a price increase in the fourth quarter. That'll help a little bit. Uh, we're, we're, we're managing the expenses as well as we can, and we believe they're transitory. You know, they're, they're, it, it's very unlikely to impossible, to, it, 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 impossible to believe that the cost of inbound freight from Asia, for example, continues where it is. Uh, a year ago, we were spending $1,500 per 40 foot container. Spot rate on those containers, in some cases is north of $20,000. We're not, we're not paying for the $20,000 containers, but in some cases we're paying north of $10,000. And so we're incurring those costs. We're being smart about which ones we're willing to incur. And we wanna make sure that, that we are disciplined around SG&A in the business, particularly in a moment where, uh, where margins are challenged. 
But we believe that over time, great brands benefit from these, these headwinds as they go away. And so we continue to grow. Uh, we continue to take share. And as these transitory costs come, come down to earth, we think ultimately that's a benefit. We'll see that flow through, particularly some of the price increases that we've had to take just, just to manage through the environment. At a certain point in time, great brands are able to keep those increases and, and they get the margin back. And, and, and our bet is that that happens with Traeger and that this environment comes down to earth at some point in time. Um, and Jeremy, I want to switch gears for the final question, because this is something we're asking all the CEOs today. It's Julie here, by the way. Um, given President Biden's um, talk last night about mandating that corporations in America tell their employees to get vaccinated or tested, I'm just curious what your policy is on that front and whether you're going to have to make any changes. Yeah, look, I mean, since, since the very first day, uh, health and safety of our, of our team has been the number one priority. Um, be, uh, above all, and uh, we have uh, we've certainly made um, you know we, we we have programs in place to support vaccination. Uh, we encourage it. I've been vaccinated. Uh, I'm glad I was. Um, you know, in terms of uh, mandating vaccination, uh, you know, we'll we'll wait and see where that goes. But uh, look, we we think vaccination is smart, and we're encouraging. In some some cases, uh, we will put some incentives in place to ensure that that happens, but. You know, we, 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 we feel very good about our policies in place. Uh, we, we haven't had uh, meaningful um, uh, COVID issues within the office, on the team. Uh, we do track that. We ask employees to, to notify us. Uh, and we've got good procedures in place, and we feel good about where we are. Good to see it. Traeger CEO, Jeremy Andrus, good to see you as always. Have a great weekend of grilling, my friend. Thanks, Brian. Take care. Education software provider PowerSchool just reported its first earnings as a publicly traded company and reported that revenue rose by 41%. We have seen, of course, a lot of different uh, school districts get further online, get further into technology, and that's benefited the company. Hardeep Gulati is with us now. He is the CEO of PowerSchool. Hardeep, good to see you um, and exciting times for you as you made this report um, as a public company. Um, as I mentioned, of course, a lot of adoption among school districts, which has been a real driver for you. Um, and according to you guys, 70% of the districts in the U.S. and Canada um, use PowerSchool, but not all of your products. And you got a lot of questions on the call about sort of expanding your reach among your existing clients. Where do you see the biggest opportunities to do that? Uh, good morning, Julia. Uh, first, uh, we, we are, we're happy with the, the results uh, for the quarter, but more importantly, the impact we are making. As you know, PowerSchool is used by 70% of the U.S. and Canadian students and uh, school districts. And uh, you know, we, on average, our school districts use more than two of our modules. We do have a full unified platform, which is one of the most industry comprehensive, which not only provides systems like student information system, where you mentioned you check the kids' grades, attendance, their homework, their uh, you know, broader report cards, but also classroom technologies like our Schoology Learning Management, which allows them to really uh, sh share their homeworks and assignments, look at online content, and as well as blended learning, so you can make sure that the kids are engaged in any form. We also support uh, our uh, talent management and back office ERP systems to make sure schools can actually recruit teachers and support uh, the whole capabilities around uh, being able to onboard them, provide the professional learning support. And our recent acquisition of Naviance earlier this year, where we have expanded it to career college and life readiness. So we're really bringing the entire end-to-end -end whole child view for these school districts which is allowing them to provide equitable education and opportunity for every child. And that's what uh, is our vision. That's the mission we have been marching on. And the first half kind of proved that our momentum really proves the value of school districts are seeing with that. And so, uh, Ardeep, thank you. So the next step then, is it to push further into the full suite of products for, for these clients? And, and how, do you, how do you expect to do that? You know, Julie, we today support almost 13,000 districts and different entities across uh, North America. And a um, lot of our capabilities when you, it comes to are, are very mission critical to them to support the daily operations as well as making sure the student outcomes are, are improved. Uh, to your point, what we are looking at is what is the next important things for these districts 
which allows them to have a look at the full digital transformation of not just their back office, but within their classrooms, as well as their entire engagement with the student and the parents as well. So uh, we continue to look at bringing the next key capability that any school district or institution needs and helping them with that uh, change management as well as helping them improve that education outcome for that child. What we also see is an opportunity, which we actually saw in the first half, uh, is around the anal our unified analytics, really bringing together all the data from system, not just power school, but multiple systems that allows them to kind of look at the full view and whole child, look at where the interventions might be required, which is very important right now with the learning loss we saw last year, but then also look at operational efficiencies, but then also look at drive better accountability across the entire district. Hey, it's Brian Chung here. Now, uh, what's interesting is that I understand you do have some initiatives when it comes to uh, getting this type of technology into the hands of communities that really need it, uh, especially with racial equity issues being highlighted over the last year or so. But one major concern is the lack of access to broadband, uh, which might pre or prevent some of these communities from being able to access cloud-based education services. So as a company, how do you approach that issue? And I understand that might extend beyond the reaches of technology for education itself, but more for broadband access. But who are you engaging with to talk about getting some of these disadvantaged communities this type of technology? Uh, you're absolutely right, Brian. We serve almost 93 of the top 100 uh, uh, education public school districts in North America. And as you can imagine, many of them are in urban areas as well as thousands of rural school districts. And access is one of the big challenges, both within the rural as well as within the urban districts. We actually do work with a lot of school districts on partnering with them in, in looking at their holistic uh, support they need. Uh, T-Mobile, uh, Verizon, they are big partners for us where we are bringing to them to jointly with those school districts to help make sure that they actually support. Uh, T-Mobile 10 million project has been one of our good partners as well as other uh, telecom providers. We do take uh, that approach even beyond. One of the initiatives we actually did with our uh, one of our long-term investor, Vista Equity and Robert Smith, who also believe in the equity in education, is also part of our million-dollar power school education fund, supporting six uh, uh, southern communities where uh, underprivileged childs, where teachers are, have to step up a lot of times in supporting those communities. Uh, we not only donated together with them 1.525 million, we're also partnering as part of our education fund of million dollars with almost eight to 10 school of educations. So we can encourage more teachers from underprivileged uh, regions and helping them bring to the profession, helping them with the certifications required so we can have more teachers who can enter the job and support and the, these communities further. And, and Hardeep, that brings up another interesting question for me. And it's really interesting that you have this education um, um, nonprofit initiative on the side of the company and, and, and makes sense given what you guys do. But that also brings up the, the core question of school funding, right? Um, I imagine that among your clients, there is a pretty broad range of their funding abilities when it comes to investing in, in the technology that you provide. So what does school funding look like going into this school year and beyond? And, and what effect is that gonna have on your business? You're absolutely right, Julie. Uh, school districts are always having to do more with less, and they always it has uh, budget pressure always remain, given the amount of uh, teachers and the resources they need to provide for every child. With that said, one of the things when you look at the broader education uh, fund funding in North America, it's been that very resilient. In fact, some of the recent federal stimulus as well as policies are supporting that even further in terms of really helping these school districts uh, pro provide all the uh, you know uh, necessary things, even that's required as part of this pandemic. One of the key things what we have been focused on is how do we uh, support these uh, school districts in those education technology? And ed EdTech is a small portion of that funding, but growing, and it has a huge opportunity for us to provide even bigger impact to these school districts on all the uh, different aspects of making sure we have more effective instructions, teachers are supported well, as well as the ability for us to really continue to uh, support the whole child, as well as the broader education outcome and the success for these, each child. So we do see that these education funding, as well as the stimulus, continue to uh, have an effective uh, opportunity for us to partner with these school districts for next, not just this year, but even to the next few years as well.
Gotcha. Very interesting, those funding questions. And then um, finally, just one last question. This is something we've been asking all of the CEOs we've been speaking with today, and it has to do with vaccine mandates, because we just heard the president last night say that there is going to be broader vaccine mandates by the federal government. What's, what's your vaccine policy at, at Power School, and are you going to have to change anything as a result of the president's plans? You know, being a technology company personally with 3,000 employees, which are across North America as well as the globe, uh, we have been able to uh, really work remotely and be able to provide a safe environment for every one of our uh, uh, employees. Uh, but more importantly, uh, this is an important topic for all of our customers. And one of the core aspects what we provide with our technology is actually helping districts manage all that information and policies to help make sure that they can continue their learning. So what we are seeing, we're supporting a lot of uh, the school districts and State Department of Education in capturing that information, being able to effectively use that in a real time, being able to really provide online enrollment. We had almost 10 million students who leverage our online enrollment this summer. We have more than uh, uh, almost uh, 15 million students who are using in the classroom to make sure that while uh, they don't, they can be, they are doing inline uh, and in-person learning, but they can also get a chance to collaborate uh, with the teachers and districts offline when it's not required. So we are really trying to support districts on, on this journey in terms of sort of making sure that they can keep the teachers and students safe, but we're to provide the continuity of learning and we are in the center of that uh, technology co components. And sorry, Hardeep, for PowerSchool itself then, since you guys are, are, are most of your employees then at home, so the, the vaccine question is, is more moot or how are, how are you thinking about that issue? Yeah, being remote right now, that question is mute. But as we continue, we push our uh, reopening to uh, start of next year. And as we kind of uh, get into that, we will be following the national and CDC guidelines to make sure that we are providing the, the safety for every one of our employees. Gotcha. Hardeep Gulati, CEO of PowerSchool. And Hardeep, kudos to you for keeping steady there. I know you were having some lighting issues on your end. You performed beautifully despite the, despite the on and off. Thanks so much, Hardeep. Good yeah, to apologies see you. that those are part of our energy saving uh, technology, but uh, you know. Listen, it, it, uh, I totally get it. I totally get it. I figured that's what it was. Hardeep, thanks so much. See you soon. Republican lawmakers are vowing to fight back against a federal vaccine mandate announced by President Biden yesterday. Governors certainly leading the fight here within the party, but the Republican National Committee is now threatening to sue the Biden administration over the policy. Let's bring in Republican Congressman French Hill joining us from the state of Arkansas. And Congressman, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, let's just start by talking about where you stand on this and what are you hearing from your constituents, particularly the businesses that would likely be ha have to enforce the mandate? Um, how big of a pushback are they getting? Well, good morning. It's good to be with you. I think it's a mixed uh, story in terms of what I've heard from employers. Many are very concerned that the mandate using an OSHA regulation will make it even harder for them to get people back to work, back to working full time. Many companies, including those with 100 or more employees, are really struggling to get their employees back and up to full speed. Uh, as you know, unemployment rate is up. Uh, wages, real wages are down and people have help wanted signs everywhere. So the first thing I heard from many of my employers in my district was this mandate may make it even more hard and more bureaucratic to get their employees back to work. What is the concern with OSHA uh, being tasked with drafting this new regulation? Well, OSHA, as you know, sets regulations on workplace safety, particularly where there are workplace hazards like a manufacturing facility or a construction site. So this is really extending OSHA's oversight into a lot of areas it's never been before. And the federal government, by doing that, is also able to then fine employers uh, uh, so many dollars per day for noncompliance. So you can see the bureaucracy there in an HR department or at a business owner on how they're going to have to now comply with a whole new set of OSHA regulations, OSHA inspections that they've never had to comply with before. So on top of being a potential detriment to getting employees back to work uh, and doing that in a safe way, you also add all this extra federal intervention and oversight in businesses where they really haven't had to deal with OSHA before. 
Yeah, Congressman, I guess, you know, a, a lot of the issue here is 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 kind of, it seems like people generally have now started to agree that, you know, vaccines are good. And it took us a while to get there, uh, you know, when we heard politicians kind of talking about them at first. Um, but it does seem like quickness is of the issue here. So, I mean, what would be a better way to roll this out rather than what President Biden's proposing here to really put the emphasis on businesses, which obviously have a very close contact to their employees? Uh, I mean, what's What's the better way? Because it seems like time is of the essence. Well, I see people being vaccinated at faster rates across the country, including in Arkansas, where it was a slow uptick uh, for many of our citizens. Uh, over 500 college campuses are uh, doing weekly testing or vaccine requirements for their kids to be back in class. I see that with a lot of businesses. So in my view, it's not that it's good or bad policy, it's trying to mandate it and then finding people and making it a federal regulatory offense if you don't do things in a certain way that I find people uh, believe to be heavy handed from the mandate point of view. When every employer already is taking practices uh, to try to keep their employees safe and create an environment where they can get people back to work uh, regardless of what their uh, personal uh, medical views are around taking a vaccine or not. So I think across the country, people recognize the importance of the vaccine. That's why you're seeing a vaccine expanding. Uh, so that's my view on it is I think for a lot of employers, it's using an OSHA mandate instead of letting them use common sense on how to keep their employees safe and have a balance in their workplace. Yeah, but I mean, I guess I guess kind of the pushback here is we've still seen millions of Americans not vaccinated, right? And and kind of what more can be done, at least something there right now, uh, a big push there. I, I mean, outside of, of well, what, the OSHA concerns yeah. you have. I mean, uh, what well, would I mean, be you might, go? why don't we, well, maybe we should require everybody who's on uh, recipient of Medicaid to be mandated that they're vaccinated. Maybe every person who crosses the U.S. border, who is an alien, needs to be vaccinated before they move. There are a lot of places where we could expand vaccination. You ask me, what am I hearing from uh, employers in my area? And that's uh, one of the views. Others uh, have said that's fine because I'm already doing it that way. So it's a mixed uh, bag. The point is, I think, that causes people concern is that you're uh, having a federal mandate in an area in a work environment where OSHA has never played and it's never played a role there. Congressman, let's talk about where things stand with the infrastructure bill. Of course, uh, we had the Senate pass it in a bipartisan manner. It looks like things are running up against a bit of a block or a wall, if you will, over in Congress, especially within your party. Um, how optimistic are you that this can be passed in a bipartisan manner? And where do you stand on the bill? Well, there's a lot of work in the House. We've uh, Republicans put forward an infrastructure bill. It was uh, voted down by the Democrats. It included a lot of innovation, including using uh, expanding a pilot program for a mileage tax for electric vehicles, for example, in order to help pay for roads, bridges, and infrastructure. People are studying what's in that bill, and they're studying the $3.5 trillion bill. As you know, Speaker Pelosi has tied them together in the House. So you keep referring to Republican opposition. There's Democratic opposition to uh, the infrastructure bill and the $3.5 trillion Bernie Sanders spending bill in the House. And so we'll have to wait and see what uh, Mrs. Pelosi and the Democratic leadership in the House actually are able to include in both of those measures or if they have to adjust them in order to get them passed in their own conference. Republicans, as a general statement, are interested in true infrastructure, roads, bridges, highway finance. That's only about 10 percent of the Senate package. Uh, they're also interested in looking at the gap in broadband. Uh, but just this week, I was in a summit on broadband infrastructure here in Arkansas with Governor Hutchison and Brendan Carr, an FCC commissioner, and FCC reports that there's more than enough money right now to close the broadband gap in the country for every American citizen if it were just simply deployed uh, in the money that's already been included in American Rescue, the CARES Act, and previous uh, Department of Agriculture uh, bills. So that's why I think you're getting 
close scrutiny at both the infrastructure piece and the Bernie Sanders social spending piece, particularly uh, the mm-hmm. tax increases on American business. Yeah, the, the I mean, to your point, we have seen maybe some pushback. Uh, Senator Manchin once again, kind of raising questions around spending, and you've been you've been critical about the idea of spending and what that might do here for inflation, at odds with maybe what we've heard from the Fed in terms of supply chain disruptions uh, versus you know some true underlying, not transitory, going to be here for a while inflation. I mean, when you look at it, uh, how do you assess those risks when it comes to, I guess, you know, the average American out there and, and costs going up and what you want to see change? Yeah, this is really an important point. And you're right to bring in both monetary policy and fiscal policy. I'm in the camp of uh, former Democratic Treasury Secretary Larry Summers back in the winter, who said the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan was too much. It was untargeted. It was unnecessary and would lead to too much fiscal stimulus. And so certainly the 3.5 trillion that Bernie Sanders has proposed in the Senate that's now coming to the House is in that same vein. When you combine it with the uh, significant continued accommodative monetary policy. So I do look at them both. I look at them in tandem. And I don't think I'm alone in my point of view uh, among the political parties. And now you see some regional Fed presidents pushing back Uh, that perhaps inflation isn't transitory, and shouldn't we take that into account and be prepared in case it's not, so that we're able to adjust both monetary and fiscal policy. So I'm I'm a yellow flashing light on inflation might not be transitory, it might get embedded in our economy. I lived through the 70s and the early 80s, I don't want to see that repeated. Congressman, getting back to the concerns that you have with the infrastructure bill as it stands right now, Is the concern here that Democrats are tying it directly to this reconciliation bill, or is it about the substance of this bipartisan bill that you have issues with? Yeah, it's bipartisan. You're right. You've made that point, and I agree with it. It got uh, uh, over 60 votes in the Senate. The composition, though, is not ideal for a rural state like Arkansas. It has a lot of money that goes essentially to urban areas and urban priorities and priorities that are not the key ones here. We're worried about things like the Interstate 40 bridge across the Mississippi River between Arkansas and Memphis. And when you see only 10% approximately of the over trillion dollar proposal going into roads and bridges, I think you find that a lot of people who represent middle America, Republican and Democrat, prefer an infrastructure bill that's more focused on roads and bridges in the five or $600 billion range, so focused on surface transportation. And that's why I think you see pushback by uh, Republicans uh, in the House, but some in the Senate on the nature of the bipartisan bill in the Senate was very uh, focused on urban areas and very focused on, I would argue, more of a Green New Deal set of priorities rather than Uh, meat and potatoes priorities for the average congressional district uh, across the country. Congressman French Hill joining us from Arkansas today, and I should say, wishing you the best of luck for your Razorbacks against the Longhorns tomorrow. Hey, Razorbacks, we're going to beat those Longhorns tomorrow. (laughs) Always good to have you on this show. President Biden last night laying out a new strategy to curb the spread of the Delta variant. Now, part of that included a plan to vaccinate Americans. He was saying that employers who have at least 100 workers should mandate vaccines or at least implement a weekly testing strategy. So we want to talk a little bit more about this with our doctor today. We have Dr. Ogichika Alozi. He's the CEO of Sunset ID Care. And doctor, it's great to see you, I guess, just in terms of what we heard from President Biden last night, because as the Delta variant continues to spread, we're looking at numbers that we haven't seen since the winter peak. What did you think of what we heard from the president last night? Well, I think, first of all, thanks for having me. But I think to get to President Biden's announcement, I think the federal government has to lead on this. This is what leadership does. There's a lot of people that aren't going to be happy with it, and that's okay. We have to change the narrative from this is a mandate to, well, this is an expectation of safety. What has happened is that we've only gotten 54% completely vaccinated, maybe 70 to 75% with one shot. 
and people take it as the exception to the rule. I think we need to change that narrative so that you expect to go into some place that everybody's vaccinated and if not, get tested to go in. Um, let's talk about those tests because part of what President Biden talked about were the tests at cost, uh, the home tests that are gonna be much more available. How reliable are those? And will they, well, how reliable are those? And is that a good step? Well, I think it is a good step. I think I'm disappointed that the federal government didn't just say, hey, we're going to get this down to European levels and make it one to three dollars a test. That's the real change that we need from the government. The tests are reliable. I personally recommend to my clients and to people that have kids, if you're trying to figure out who's infectious, use the antigen test. CVS, Walgreens, a host of other pharmacies have them. They're a good test to determine, are you infectious? And I think that's really the key. The other thing, too, sort of going back is, you know, we've saw, seen this Swiss cheese model, right? And everybody talks as if every slice of that Swiss cheese model is the same size. And that's a fallacy. The biggest piece of cheese is vaccines. And we got to figure out how to get people to like the taste of that cheese. And then we can add other things on top of it, whether it's testing vaccine, whether it's testing masks, the right masks, not a cloth mask, but the right type of masking. Doctor, we also had the news this week of uh, the vaccine mandates for Los Angeles, that public school system. They're going to require those 12 and older, so those who are eligible to get vaccinated, to be vaccinated in order to return to school. Is this something that makes sense? And is this necessary in order to have a successful school year? Yeah, I guess I'm surprised at the contention around vaccine mandates or requirements is a better word in schools. At every stage of education that I've ever been in, elementary, college, med school, residency, fellowship, and my master's in public health, you had to show evidence that you had an MMR and a Tdap and a TB test to get in and to attend classes. This is not a new concept. People are making this seem like this is suddenly a unique thing that we've never done before. I think at the end of the day, and this is, I'm not an economist, but to get people back to trusting in the economy and engaging in society, we have to let them know that our kids are safe and that where they go to spend their money and engage in society is gonna be safe as well. Doctor, one of the um, paid TV bloviators was commenting about the president's speech yesterday and said that this is not the speech you use to persuade people who've not gotten vaccinated to get vaccinated. And what I think I hear you saying and what others have said is this was not about persuading that the time for that is over. This is about the time for action. Do you think the president should step it up? Well, I think the president missed on a couple of things. I think the masking and having a conversation about the right masks, the testing. There are others that talk about the transportation vaccine passports. I'm personally not there yet. But here's what I do believe truly. In healthcare, we are the only country that's still having this conversation, right? We have the solution to the riddle, which is COVID, and that's vaccines. The vaccines are safe. They're wildly efficacious. And of the patients that I see and my colleagues across the country are seeing in jammed hospitals, it's primarily 90 plus percent those that are unvaccinated. I think the unvaccinated have more than enough time to get vaccinated. The only pushback will be that the amount of angst this is going to cause is not worth the maybe five to 7% extra squeeze that you're going to get out of the unvaccinated. But I think employers, healthcare employers, from my perspective, really have to step it up. And I think people deserve to be safe when they walk into a hospital and other places. And the best way to do that is vaccines. And Dr. Kids under 12, they're still not eligible for the vaccines. We hear from the FDA today saying that they're hopeful over the next couple of months. But from what you're hearing, from what you're reading, I guess, when can we expect children under the age of 12 to get a vaccine? Yeah, it's looking like a November, December thing. And I have an 11 year old that has not been vaccinated. He fortunately where I am in El Paso, Texas is in face-to-face -face school and he hasn't had any issues. I think that parents are worried, parents are concerned. I, I do think though that the American Academy of Pediatrics, they pushed the FDA a little bit to say, hey, get this done quicker. I think that's the wrong step. I think that if you want people to trust a vaccine that they're going to give to their children, it has to be done in the right time with the right data. And I think the FDA and the CDC, they'll do the right job and hopefully they'll get us that information very clearly by November, December so we can go into the winter months and into next year 
with the opportunity for those that want to get their children vaccinated to vaccinate. Thank you for mentioning your 11-year-old being in face-to-face -face classes. Is your 11-year-old wearing a mask? And are there children in that class who are not wearing masks? What's that experience like for the 11 year old. Yeah, you know, Texas is one of those states where we've divided ourselves into tribes around protecting children and masking. Um, when we can argue all we want about the data. My son is 11, he wears a KN95, he has a host of them. He also has surgical masks in his backpack in case he's playing outside and he gets dirty and, or torn. My push to the school districts has been to use some of that CARES money, some of the money that President Biden talked about, and make sure that kids coming to school have the right masks. I think that is critical. I also think that we probably don't need to be masking down to two. And again, that's a WHO versus CDC issue. But I think in this environment where a lot of people are concerned and parents are concerned, I think it's fair to have kids mask. I don't think it should be the drama and uh, all the angst that we've created over it. Adam, let's take a look at Love's app because speaking of names that are on the move today, shares jumping here with the stock up just around 7%. Now, Lovesack was out with earnings beating on both the top and bottom lines. And you can see investors clearly excited about what they heard from the company. So we want to bring in Sean Nelson, the CEO and founder of Lovesack. And Sean, it's great to have you. Congratulations on the strong quarter, beating on both the top and bottom lines. Your market cap now over a billion dollars. What's your big takeaway from the quarter? Yeah, uh, it's been a crazy year, and uh, we've seen our stock go up and down even as uh, the business has only gone up. Um, we've had record growth, uh, stacked on now three years of very high growth, and we've turned profitable last year and you know two profitable quarters into this year, and uh, really, really happy with the way the business is performing, even in this turbulent you know supply chain. Uh, ridden market. So how do you sustain that growth uh, once we've emerged uh, fully from the pandemic and the housing market cools off? Yeah, for, for us, we're at the right place at the right time. You know, we are catching our stride. Uh, one of the greatest examples of that is for the first time ever uh, this year, our awareness for people buying our products, number one source is word of mouth as opposed to our own advertising, you know? So I think our brand is catching on, our product sectionals, which drives 75 plus percent of our business, is catching on these modular sofas that could be with you the rest of your lives. You can add to them, grow them, rearrange them. We started with sacks that kind of made us famous, gave us our name, these giant not bean bags filled with foam, but uh, sectionals have just exploded. So for us, you know, even was maybe these COVID tailwinds, people staying at home, buying couches, uh, perhaps may subside. I think that Love Sack is gaining momentum and gaining market share rapidly against um, the incumbents in the market that sell boring old furniture that can't do what ours can do. Sean, you mentioned that challenging supply chain uh, landscape. How have you as a company navigated this? Because this is something we've talked about with a number of CEOs uh, over the past several months. And it's also a situation that doesn't seem to be improving significantly, at least at this point. No doubt. Um, <clears throat> the supply chain globally right now is a mess. And thankfully, over the last couple of years, as we faced into tariffs first, we we got really aggressive spinning up redundant factories uh, in not just outside of China. So China, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam. And so as we have flare-ups with COVID, we have uh, ports, congestion, what have you, these seats and sides you know, that you're looking at right now that make up sectionals, it's ones and zeros, it's digital furniture, and we bring them in by the container load. And they're, they're the same. They're the same uh, yesterday and tomorrow, and they're reverse compatible with each other. So we can go deep on inventory. We can bring inventory out of numerous uh, sources and dodge a lot of these bullets that are disrupting uh, many people's supply chains. We've been in stock all the way through. You, you buy a couch from us, it's delivered in days to your door by FedEx, and that's been unique to Lovesack and will continue as we go forward, we believe. I wish I had known that when we got our new couch and then had to wait eight <laughs> months for it to get here. Real quick, um, and I did this online, so correct, because online is online. Uh, the, the naked love sacks are made in the United States, but the coverings are coming from perhaps Vietnam and China. I mean, yeah. would it make sense to do it all here in the USA? Yeah. 
Yeah, we we definitely view domestic manufacturing as our long term outcome, not not just based on the current supply chain situation, which we do believe will come back into focus some at some point, maybe later next year. Um, but on principle, we have this design for life philosophy, making things that are built to last a lifetime, designed to evolve, that are truly sustainable, and a circle to consumer operating philosophy. And so sustainability is in our bones. And we believe that manufacturing from recycled goods, we're the single largest repurposer of plastic water bottles to home deck fabric in the US already, making all of our upholstery out of recycled plastic water bottle spun fabric. So that's just the tip of the iceberg, making it closer to the consumer, shipping in over shorter distances, shipping out over shorter distances, perhaps with e-vehicles. That's where we're going. And so, uh, it's not just the current supply chain disruption that has us motivated to do that. It It's in our bones and, and we will get there. Sean, what are the areas of growth or opportunity for your company? What does that product pipeline look like? Well, first, you know, we believe this Sactionals product, um, I bet you don't even know anyone who owns Sactionals. You know, we're still an up and coming brand, but we're the fastest growing furniture retailer in the United States. It'll carry us past a billion in sales. Uh, annually at some point. And so we have a, a good runway to develop other things. We have over 40 issued patents on things, not just sectionals, but other inventions as well. Things that will be built to last a lifetime, designed to evolve. So if you look around your home and you say, man, that would be cool to see this built to last a lifetime, designed to evolve with me, change, wash, rearrange, grow with me. My sectionals in my living room are 14 years old. They're mated to all of our newest inventions. So it's all reverse compatible. We will do that in other verticals as well. Meanwhile, in October, uh, November timeframe, we we have a big product launch that we've been just waiting to announce and we can look forward to that. And it will be our next foray into a new category and, and really reveal uh, what's next for LoveSack and why we're so bullish on our outlook. And Sean, just because you have this unique perspective, this view into the consumer, we've been talking about maybe consumers are pulling back on their spending now as a Delta variant uh, emerges and really takes over uh, nationwide. Are you seeing that at all in your business? It doesn't look like at least from last quarter that that has been reflected in your business. Yeah, 65% top line growth last quarter, following a greater than 50% the quarter before, stacked on years of 30 and 40% growth. So no, we're not seeing a pullback even, even now. And uh, and it might be unique to Love Sack. Like I said, we're kind of the right product in the right place at the right time, at the right stage in our evolution, coming up as a brand and being the disruptor. Uh, but uh, so far, we are seeing no signs of slowing in this home category as it pertains to what we're doing. Sean Nelson, CEO and founder of LoveSack. Great to speak with you. We look forward to having you back on Yahoo Finance. And again, LoveSack shares up just around 7% today. We're going to pause right now as the whole nation will be pausing tomorrow to honor what happened 20 years ago and the more than 3,000 souls that we lost on 9-11. We want to bring into the stream right now Tunnel to Towers Foundation Chairman and CEO Frank Siller. Um, to talk about many things, uh, you just uh, completed a 500 mile walk um, to draw attention to, I, I guess, uh, putting yourself uh, in other people's shoes, so to speak, about what all of us and what the country goes through. But this is personal for you, the foundation, because it was your brother, um, one of seven children in your family, a firefighter who lost his life on 9-11. Can you tell us more about 20 years later, how the foundation is making a difference? Well, look, my brother's a New York City firefighter, and forgive me if you, people notice I'm in a car because I'm not quite finished my 537-mile journey tomorrow. I'll be walking through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. And uh, why am I walking through that tunnel? Because 20 years ago, my brother was a New York City firefighter who on September 11, 2001, was on his way home to play golf with me, my brother George, my brother Russ, and heard on the radio scanner that the towers were hit. So he drove back to his firehouse, squad one in Brooklyn, got his gear, drove, drove to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, was closed for security reasons. So he put his gear on and ran through that tunnel to the towers where he gave up his life while saving others. And uh, so, you know, we were so, proud of what he did. Uh, he was our youngest brother. 
He was much younger than all of us. I was 14 years older than him, and I was closest in age. My brother Russ was 25 years older than him. So uh, he was our little gift uh, from God uh, when, it, when he was born. Uh, it was a tremendous loss for our family. But we're so proud of what he did. We said, you know what? We better honor. We have to honor what he did, and we have for 20 years. And uh, that's why we started the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. And uh, I'm sure in a few moments we'll talk about the great work that we're doing. Yeah, Frank, and we certainly want to get to that. But I first just want to ask you a little bit more about that 500-mile walk that you will be completing tomorrow because you started down in D.C. by the Pentagon. You went to Shanksville, Pennsylvania. You're going to end through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, like you said, tomorrow, uh, going to the site of the towers. What has the past few weeks been like for you as you have completed this 500-mile journey? Uh, it's been very emotional, very gratifying. I am, uh, I, my spirits are very high and I feel pretty confident. I don't say 100% confident, but I do feel more like America will never, was not going to forget. And because I'm all these small towns, I'm walking and they're honking the horn, they're yelling, never forget. We had eight parades, thousands of people at each one of these parades. They're bringing their young kids. They're talking about 9-11. I was at a parade last Saturday in Easton, Pennsylvania. Over 300 high school kids marched in a high school marching band. And they were just so patriotic. And they, I, I know they know the story of 9-11. So this is exactly why I want to do this walk. I want to make sure we never forget and that we all honor the sacrifice. And for me personally, I wanted to honor my little brother in a way that was different uh, and a way that he knows, well, he always knows how much I love him, but in a way that other people know how much my family love my brother and how much we miss him. And I, and I think we've accomplished that with this, uh, with this walk. And I wanted to bring a great attention to the foundation because we have work that we have to do to help these great families that continuously die for our country and, our, for, uh, and for our community. Tell us about that work. Well, uh, so we do a few things. First, we build smart homes for our country's most catastrophically injured uh, service members, those who have given their bodies for their country. Double, triple, triple quadruple amputees, uh, paraplegics, quadriplegics, and then on. Uh, they're given, like once I said, their bodies for their country. Mortgage-free smart homes. They're fantastic. They're giving back some of their independence. We pay off the mortgage or build homes for Gold Star families. Now, we're talking about the families of these great heroes that go and serve our country, so we don't have another 9-11. They're over there in Afghanistan, Iraq. Many of them, you know, you know, paid a tremendous price for, uh, for our freedom here. And uh, so we, we deliver mortgage-free homes for them. If they have a home, we pay off the mortgage. If they don't have a home, we are, uh, we, uh, we build them a mortgage-free home. And I am gonna be speaking uh, tomorrow with widow of Lance Corporal Riley uh, McCullum. And his wife, Jenna, is the one that is pregnant and will be giving birth to uh, their child uh, in a few days. And uh, we're going to we're going to build them a mortgage uh, free home. And that's our commitment to our Gold Star families that, you know, you go serve our country, and you don't come home. We're going to deliver you a, a mortgage free home. And last but not least, our first responders, like my brother was a first responder, this every single day they go out there and they risk their lives for us. And so many times they give their life for us. And the Tunnel to Towers Foundation has made a promise that we, when you do that, when you go out and you leave a young cam family behind, we're gonna deliver you a, a mortgage-free home. 200 of those mortgage-free homes we're delivering this year, 200. But we count on the generosity and the kindness of Americans. If we had a million people come together to donate as little as $11 a month, and I call it a stinking, $11 a month because it's not much. It's a couple of co cups of coffee a month that if we had a million people come together and do that, we could take care of just not the 200 homes this year, but 200 next year and the year after and the year after that, because there's a tremendous need. If I had enough money now, I, I could do a thousand homes right now. That's how many people that, that, that I should have helped already that the Tunnel to Towers Foundation uh, should have helped already, but we're not able to until we raise that that money. So $11 a month, we could take care of all these great families. It should be a promise that every American makes to all these great families that once again, like I said, that are willing to die for you and I. 
Frank Ziller, the task is great. It sounds to me as if your heart is even bigger than the task at hand. We appreciate what you're doing. Good luck on the last few miles of your walk tomorrow. Tunnel to Towers Foundation Chairman and CEO Frank Ziller.